Mess, I wouldn't do this. Welcome to this presentation of Frozen in Time here on the NHL Network. I'm Dan Palmer. Today we'll head to Edmonton, Alberta, Canada and relive the glory days of the Oilers dynasty. It all began when Edmonton was an elite franchise in the World Hockey Association in 1978. The WHA Oilers had just appeared in the Avco World Trophy Championship, but they'd be forced to dissolve their lineup upon entering the NHL. This would give general manager Glenn Sather the tough task of rebuilding his club almost from scratch. The Oilers were looking to prove themselves during the early years in the NHL. When Edmonton joined the league during the expansion of 1979, they knew that there was a lot of work to be done. Glenn Sather started the difficult task of constructing a winner through the NHL entry draft. One piece of the puzzle that Sather had from the very beginning was a young phenom named Wayne Gretzky. Edmonton owner Peter Pocklington had a clause in Gretzky's personal service contract that did not allow the young star to be included in the entry draft. When Gretzky entered the league, and he doubted his ability to dominate, but dominate he did. Gretzky finished tied with the legendary Marcel Dion in the scoring race with 137 points and won the Hart Trophy as a 19-year-old. Gretzky would set the bar of excellence even higher the next season when he posted a new career high of 164 points. In the 1981 playoffs, the Oilers had their first meeting with a dynasty when they faced the New York Islanders. The Islanders were defending Stanley Cup champions and possessed a powerful and intimidating offense. The Oilers would put up an impressive fight for such a young club, but in the end, the playoff experience of New York proved to be too much. New York would defeat Edmonton in six games en route to their second consecutive Stanley Cup. It was a 1981-82 season that the Oilers franchise really took shape. After finishing with a record below 500 in each of their first two seasons, it was the third year that everything fell into place. Edmonton exploded out of the gates, posting an impressive 25-9-6 record in the first three months of the season. The Oilers were well on their way to a first place finish, but all eyes turned to Wayne Gretzky in his pursuit of an incredible record as he quickly was closing in on Phil Esposito's mark of 76 goals in a season. Worked it by Bill Height to center. Sabres get it back. Patrick gave it away. Here's Gretzky. Gretzky was not done setting records there. He had set the record for points in a season the previous year, but he went on to smash each and every record he had already set. Gretzky finished the year with an eye-popping 92 goals, 120 assists, and 212 points. It was a year of offensive production, the likes of which no one had ever witnessed. Gretzky helped power the Oilers to their first ever first place finish, 48 wins and 111 points. The Oilers were firing on all cylinders as they marched into the playoffs and prepared to face the last place Los Angeles Kings. The Oilers were overwhelming favorites in this division semifinal matchup with the Kings. Los Angeles had finished 17 games below 500 with 48 fewer points than Edmonton. The Kings shocked the Oilers though by splitting the first two games in Edmonton. In Game 3, it seemed like the Oilers had a firm hold on the game and the series as they held a 5-0 lead in the third period. But disaster would strike as the Kings battled back to cut the lead to one. The unthinkable then would happen when rookie King Steve Bozick would score the tying goal with just five seconds remaining in regulation. The game-winning goal by rookie Darrell Evans had completed one of the most remarkable comebacks in playoff history. The Kings rallied from five goals down, and it would be dubbed the Miracle on Manchester, and remains a cherished piece of Los Angeles Kings history. The Edmonton Oilers were trying to rebound from a shocking and embarrassing playoff loss to the Los Angeles Kings as the 1982-83 regular season began. Unfortunately, the powerful Oilers stumbled out of the gate and 
finish the month of October two games below 500. The struggles would not last very long, however, as Edmonton posted a 25-9-7 record the following three months. The Oilers' offense was like no other in the league. Wayne Gretzky compiled another sensational season with 71 goals and 196 points. The supporting cast were all among league leaders as well. Marc Messier would make a more well-rounded contribution, cutting his penalty minutes by 40 and setting a personal best with 58 assists and 106 points. The Moose's winger, Glenn Anderson, scored 10 more goals than the previous year in eight fewer games for a career-high 48 and finished tied for third in the Oilers with 104 points. Anderson was tied with Yuri Curry, who benefited greatly from playing on Gretzky's wing and finished with career bests in goals at 45, assists at 59, and in points as well. What made Edmonton's four 100-point scorers even more remarkable was that there were just seven other players throughout the rest of the league to reach the century mark. The Oilers would benefit from all of their offense and finish atop the Smythe Division for the second consecutive season. Heading into the playoffs, Edmonton's aggressive, wide-open style was considered both an advantage and a detriment for the young Oilers. The advantage was they carried an aura of confidence and intimidation into the opponent's building, an advantage that often gave them a decided edge before the drop of the puck. The detriment was their lack of defensive awareness did not play into the traditional mold of tight-checking defensive playoff hockey. The Oilers were proving all their critics wrong. The Smythe Division semifinal against the Winnipeg Jets, the Division Final against the Calgary Flames, and the Conference Final against the Chicago Blackhawks were nothing short of a cakewalk. The young Oilers had steamrolled their opponents, losing just once through the first three rounds. The Stanley Cup Final figured to be a much different story, however, as the Oilers found themselves facing the three-time defending champion, New York Islanders. The playoff experience of the Islanders proved to be far too much for the Oilers to handle. Boasting the likes of Bossy, Gillies, Nystrom and Potvin, the Islanders swept the Oilers in four straight. Edmonton was disappointed with their performance in their first Stanley Cup appearance, but they could take solace in the fact that they had lost to a franchise that had just captured their fourth consecutive Stanley Cup. The Oilers put together a remarkable regular season in 1983-84 that saw them finish first overall with 119 points. Wayne Gretzky again led the league in scoring with 87 goals and 205 points. It was the second time in three seasons that Gretzky had eclipsed the 200-point plateau. Remarkably, Oilers defenseman Paul Coffey finished second in the league scoring race with 126 points. The Edmonton Oilers were definitely the flashiest club in the NHL, but they knew that they would not garner any respect if they couldn't translate their regular season achievements into postseason success. The Oilers were back in the Stanley Cup Final, and they were looking for revenge. Edmonton had not forgotten being embarrassed by the Islanders in a four-game sweep in 1983. Edmonton's offense proved to be too much, as they outscored the Islanders 19-6 over the last three games en route to their first-ever Stanley Cup. The Oilers had put an end to New York's dynasty of four straight Stanley Cup victories and would begin to create their own place in history. When we return on this edition of Frozen in Time, we'll find out how the Oilers would respond to their first Stanley Cup championship. Would they dominate in 1985? Find out next. We have a little bit of a challenge. We have a play hard every night because every night team is going to want to beat the Edmonton Oilers. Um, but like I said, really not a big secret the last couple of years. We haven't been well liked by a lot of teams. Uh, just the fact that we have Stanley Cup champions in front of us now, uh, like I said, make it a little bit tougher. You were shooting at the Islanders last year. What's the difference uh, with everybody shooting at you in 1984? Well, I don't think there's any difference. Uh, they were shooting at us last year and the year before. They've been doing that since we've had Wayne with us. And Wayne is the central point of our hockey club, and every time we go in the building, the, the, the players are, are out to stop them, the fans try to stop them. Everyone does. It's no different from last year. I think that we're going to have to work just as hard as we did last year. A significant move was made in the offseason when the Oilers dealt super pest Ken Lindsman to the Boston Bruins for versatile forward Mike Krushelnitsky. Crusher was immediately placed in Edmonton's top line with Wayne Gretzky and Yari Curry to form one of the league's most formidable trios. Gretzky was fresh off his second 200-point season in three years, and 
Curry had broken the 50 goal plateau for the first time in his career. The Edmonton Oilers picked up exactly where they left off after winning their first Stanley Cup in 1984, beginning the season on a 15 game undefeated streak. While Edmonton boasted an intimidating offense, head coach Glenn Sather just couldn't seem to find the proper winger to complement Mark Messier and Glenn Anderson. Still struggling to find the right fit, the general manager made his move, trading a pair of players to the North Stars for Mark Napier. Wednesday night, Mark Napier got the notice that he was being dealt to the defending Stanley Cup champion Oilers for rookie Gord Shervin and journeyman Terry Martin. Well, I guess it, it's a bit of a shock when you first find out, but uh, you know, the more I think about it now, the uh, the happier I am. It's uh, you know, it's a great opportunity for me, and uh, you know, another chance to. Uh, to play on, uh, you know, hopefully a Stanley Cup team. So it's, uh, you know, the, like I say, the more I think about it, the happier I get. Oilers coach Glenn Sather will certainly have a potentially high-scoring line if Napier's teamed up with Glenn Anderson and Mark Messier once Messier comes off his suspension. Well, I would say so right now. Uh, it really depends on how he fits in. I guess it's the same sort of problem we've had with Wayne and Yari. We've had trouble trying to find somebody to play with them. But... Uh, you know, Kruzaniski has fitted in very well there, and uh, I can't see any reason why Napier wouldn't fit in there with, with these other two fellows. So if the experiment works and uh, it's successful, we'll leave him there. The move seemed to be a successful one. As Napier settled in nicely with Edmonton, recording 35 points in 33 games. The focus would not be on the new oiler for very long, however, as all eyes turned on Yari Curry. The Finnish right winger was taking a serious run at the record books as he chased Mike Bossy 68 goals by a right winger, an NHL best. Well, I would like to get the record, that's for sure, and I would like to get that record as soon as possible. That's what I'm looking for right now. Interesting on Tuesday night because your next game is in Long Island against the Islanders against Mike Bossy. I guess that would even be a little more appropriate. Yeah, I would like to, you know, I'm really looking for, yeah, hopefully we get the team going too. Curry would not disappoint as he broke that record finishing the season with 71 goals in just 73 games. Remarkably, that placed him second on the club in goal scoring, two behind Gretzky. Despite finishing the season with a lackluster effort, the Oilers had a tougher task in disposing of Los Angeles than most had expected. Edmonton needed a pair of overtime games to finish the three-game sweep of the fourth-place Kings. Los Angeles became an unforeseen obstacle one that required the Oilers to quickly find their A game. Any hopes the Jets had of giving the Oilers a true test were diminished when they lost their star forward Dale Howarchuk to a rib injury in the previous series against the Flames. Game one saw the Jets playing a conservative defensive game in an effort to keep the Oilers in check. Edmonton would fight through the tight checking affair and earn a 4-2 victory. Well, when I scored, I remember Anders Hedberg's first NHL goal as an empty netter. <laughs> So I felt, kind of felt like that. It, it was uh, it was nice to get it. I wish I would have scored on the breakaway previous, but we won the hockey game, and uh, it's behind me now. Maybe I broke, broke the bubble. Another pair of victories in games two and three, and Edmonton was on the verge of sweeping their division rivals. Winnipeg had done an admirable job keeping the Oilers' big guns under wraps throughout the first three games of the series, but game four would be a completely different story. Craig is taken out of the play by Carlisle. The puck loose in the corner. Carlisle loses it. Gretzky scores as he took the puck and walked out from behind the net. Ron Wilson tried to slide it out to Lundholm. It was picked off and Gretzky breaks in. Working against Ellis. Gretzky scores! It comes out to Randy Carlisle. Put the head to Gretzky and Gretzky is going to equal the Stanley Cup record. No! Gretzky would tie his own playoff record with an incredible seven-point night as the Oilers completed the four-game sweep against the Jets. Still to come on the show, the Oilers were two rounds away from their second consecutive Stanley Cup championship. But first, they had to get past the Chicago Blackhawks. Highlights when we return. The Edmonton Oilers showed absolutely no rust in Game 1 of the Campbell Conference Final against the Chicago Blackhawks. Despite having nine days off between the second and third rounds, Edmonton came out firing and led the Blackhawks 3-1 after the first period. The Oilers continued to press in the second, scoring four unanswered goals. 
the prettiest of which saw Gretzky and Curry executing a two-on-one break beautifully to give Edmonton an 8-1 lead after 40 minutes. Murray Bannerman would watch the final period from the bench as the Oilers cruised to an 11-1 win to open the series. After winning the next game by a score of 7-3, Edmonton had a firm two-game-to-none grasp on the series. The Blackhawks would not roll over, however, as they came out flying in Game 3. Denny Savard would seal a 5-2 Blackhawk victory with a nice breakaway goal on Grant Fuhr to get Chicago back into the series. Surprisingly, the Blackhawks would also go on to win Game 4, evening the series at two games apiece. Returning to Edmonton for Game 5, the Oilers were oozing with confidence as they boasted a 6-0 record at home in the playoffs. Chicago rode a modest two-game win streak into Game 5, but their momentum came to a screeching halt when the Oilers handed them an embarrassing 10-5 loss. Now one game away from clinching the series, Edmonton traveled to Chicago for Game 6. While many considered Chicago fans to be the loudest and the rowdiest in the NHL, when Oilers head coach Glenn Sather was asked about them, he had his own way of describing the Blackhawk faithful. Drunk. You know, they drink an awful lot in this building. Uh, they're, they're out of control. They do a lot of things that they shouldn't do. But uh, I guess they pay their 12 or 15 or $20, and if they want to come here and drink, it's up to them. The Oilers silenced those fans by getting on the board early and often, leading 2-0 after one period of play. Edmonton would put it away in the second period, scoring four unanswered goals, including Curry's hat-trick goal. The Oilers would not look back, winning the game 8-2 and taking the series in six. The final started at the Philadelphia Spectrum. The Flyers would come out strong in the first period and would finally solve Grant Fuhrer when Ilka Sinisalo chipped it past the Edmonton goaltender on a two-man advantage for a 1-0 lead. After a scoreless middle frame, Ron Sutter would capitalize on a turnover in the third period, beating Fuhr on the backhand to put the Flyers up 2-0. More sloppy play from Edmonton later in the period would lead to Tim Kerr scoring the 3-0 goal, as the Flyers held on for a 4-1 victory in Game 1. The Oilers were determined not to drop a pair on the road again and came out as a different squad in Game 2. Grant Fuhrer was making timely stops early in the game, and Edmonton managed to outwork the Flyers, capitalizing on mistakes and creating their own opportunities en route to a 3-1 victory. After taking the next two games at home, the Oilers carried a 3-1 series lead into Game 5. Philadelphia was now missing two key components, as power forward Tim Kerr and defenseman Brad McCrimmon had fallen to injury. As a result, the Flyers found themselves severely outmatched. Edmonton tallied five unanswered goals and seemed nearly untouchable, evidenced by the perfectly executed three-on-two rush involving Yari Curry, Wayne Gretzky, and Mike Krushelniski. After dropping the first game of the final, Edmonton had come back to crush the Flyers, winning four straight games, capped off with an 8-3 drubbing in Game 5 to capture the 1985 Stanley Cup, their second consecutive. Oh, I'll tell you, two Stanley Cups in the win. One can of cup with the under two years is just phenomenal. And Last year it was, uh, uh, I suppose, a stunned excitement. This year it's, uh, I guess, like a second child. I hope the family will grow. It's very satisfying. We were the underdogs coming into last year. Uh, this year, even though we did come in second, everyone felt comfortable and confident that we could uh, win this series. Philadelphia, I have to give them a lot of credit because they had some very, very tough injuries. They weren't the team that we saw during the season. Yeah. I, I didn't want I didn't want to go back to Philadelphia, and I didn't want to fly back to Philadelphia. Uh, and I didn't want to have to get up in the morning at 7.30 and get on the airplane and say, oh, my God, what are we doing? <laughs> we wanted this one badly. We were, we were saying that people had us won the Stanley Cup. We came in the room and said, hey, to win tonight, we got to play the best game of our, our year. And we did. We played probably the best game of the year. Ahead on the show, we'll focus on Oilers defenseman Paul Coffey as he takes a run at Bobby Orr and the history books. Stick around. Edmonton looked to be a stronger squad than the year before. There wasn't much of a challenge clinching first place as the Oilers won the Smythe Division by 20 points. In 1985, all eyes had turned to Curry late in the season as he chased Mike Bossy's scoring record. This time, in 1986, the focus was on Paul Coffey. Incredibly, the Oilers defenseman was trying to break a record once deemed unbreakable. 
In the early 70s, Bobby Orr had established a new level of excellence among blue liners by recording five straight 100-point seasons. In 1975, however, Orr scored an astounding 46 goals, the most ever by a defenseman, and a total that seemed untouchable. Paul Coffey, who was now commonly regarded as the top offensive blue liner in the league, would make history in 1986 as he shocked the hockey world by breaking Orr's record. 36 years old, although some question that. Here's Coffey on a rush, right in, shoot, scores! It's something I can't really, really celebrate right now because we've got a lot of hockey ahead of us. I mean, we've got to win the Stanley Cup, and it's something that I'll sit back. I mean, it's when I leave the room here, I'll really be happy in the summertime. And it's like winning two Stanley Cups years down the road. You, you cherish stuff like that. Heading into the playoffs, another long postseason run seemed to be a lock for the Oilers. In the opening round, Edmonton made quick work of Vancouver, sweeping the Canucks in three games. The second round would prove to be an incredibly grueling affair as the Flames and Oilers staged yet another classic battle of Alberta. The series opened in Edmonton, with the Flames jumping out to an early two-goal lead. To nobody's surprise, the series opener was an intense and physical matchup that ended with the Flames shocking their provincial rivals with a 4-1 victory. The Oilers would salvage a win at home in Game 2, sending the series to Calgary tied at one game apiece. The Flames would not allow the Oilers to carry any momentum into Game 3 as they jumped out to an early 1-0 lead, courtesy of Paul Reinhardt. The Flames would play a disciplined game, and Mike Vernon would allow just a pair of Edmonton goals as the Flames won Game 3 by a score of 3-2. The clubs would split the next two games, putting the Oilers on the brink of elimination as they trailed the series three games to two. Early on in game six, both teams came out with incredible intensity, treating the fans to some highly entertaining, wide open, end-to-end -end play. In each of their three wins during the series, the Flames had scored first. And game six was no different. Veteran forwards Joe Mullen and John Tonelli gave Calgary an early 2-0 lead. The two-time defending Stanley Cup champions would not give up, however, and the Oilers' big guns answered, scoring five unanswered goals en route to a season-saving 5-2 victory, forcing a seventh and deciding game. Keeping with tradition, the Flames opened the scoring in the first period on Hack and Lube's shorthanded goal. Early in the second, Jim Paplinski gained the Oiler blue line and let a harmless shot go. Grant Fuhrer could not corral the puck, however, Flame captain would bang in his own rebound to give Calgary a 2-0 lead. Wayne Gretzky would help cut the lead in half, setting up Glenn Anderson to capitalize on a two-on-one rush, with less than a minute remaining in the middle frame. Yari Curry would pick up a loose puck in the neutral zone and send Marc Messier in all alone to tie the game at two. Unfortunately for the Oilers fans, a routine play early in the third period would turn to disaster as a simple dump-in by Flames' Perry Verizon would lead to a now infamous goal. Gretzky with Crucial Nitsky. Over to Napier. Napier flipped the shot. Vernon out of the net to make the save. Vernon came out to challenge that time, as Grant Fuhrer did in the second period on Steve Bozak. Oh, they score! Oh, Steve Smith, in attempting to get it out of his own zone, put it in the net. The Oilers could not recover from such a devastating blow as Steve Smith's own goal held up as the game winner helping the Flames to a 3-2 win and a series victory. After the contest, Steve Smith was understandably inconsolable and distraught. Well, I think right now I've just got to collect my thoughts and, uh, you know, let uh, things happen as they do. Can you recall what happened? Exactly. <laughs> Well, I went back for the puck and I uh, saw a couple of guys breaking fast and I tried to move the puck up fast and, uh, you know, I just happened to hit the side of Grant's pad and uh, it went in. It's just the worst feeling I've ever had in my life. When we return on Frozen in Time, the Oilers were trying to make amends for an embarrassing 1986 loss to the Flames. Will the Oilers once again be crowned Stanley Cup champions? Find out after the break. Gretzky assisted on the opening goal to give him 177 career playoff points, passing Jean Beliveau for first all time. Edmonton would run up the score. Led by Gretzky's six assists, seven point night, and Curry's four goals, 
The Oilers set a new record for goals in one game with a 13-3 defeat of the Kings. Edmonton was on a roll and swept both games on the road and returned home with a three game to one series lead. With a chance to wrap up the series, Edmonton jumped out to an early lead. The teams would exchange goals and the game would be tied at three after 40 minutes of play. The Oilers would not be denied and in the third period, they scored a pair of goals to claim a 5-4 victory and win the series four games to one. The Edmonton Oilers now moved on to the division finals against the Winnipeg Jets. Game one would prove to be a seesaw affair as the two teams exchanged goals for much of the contest. While most clubs would choose to shadow the Gretzky-Curry line, the Oilers had the advantage of a second line that was superior to most teams' top lines. Mark Messier and Glenn Anderson made the difference in the series opener as the pair provided two goals, including a 3-2 game winner. The Jets opened the scoring for the second straight contest in game two. Unfortunately for Winnipeg, the Oilers woke up and tallied four unanswered goals on their way to an easy 5-3 victory. Now trailing the series two games to none, the Jets knew that game three was do or die. Winnipeg threw all the offense they could muster at Grant Fuhr, but the Oiler netminder was sensational and made 35 saves. The tandem of Gretzky and Curry once again proved to be too much and helped the Oilers win game three by a score of 5-2. Edmonton wanted to put game four away early and open the scoring just five minutes into the first period. Shortly after, Gretzky and Rutsalainen would tally goals just 48 seconds apart, and the Oilers cruised to a 4-2 victory to complete the four-game sweep of the Jets. Like we're noticed for a lot of teams that they're going to say, be patient, be patient, the Oilers are going to make enough mistakes to lose. But we haven't been doing that in the playoffs. It's a real commitment by the forwards, by your scoring lines, and we're trying to pick, pick this block up in that manner. The way we're playing right now is the way they win Stanley Cups, and I don't think I've ever seen, even when we won two Stanley Cups, I don't think I've ever seen our team play any better. Well, I think they pushed us hard, and, uh, you know, they made us work. And, I mean, they're a terrific hockey team, and they're going to be a great team in the future. So I just hope we're in the future to fight with them. Next up were the Detroit Red Wings in the Campbell Conference Final. Detroit were a playoff surprise after they finished second in the Norris Division with an unimpressive two games below 500. The Oilers took their opponents too lightly in Game 1, however, and the Red Wings stole the opener with a tenacious 3-1 victory. It would be a different Edmonton club that took the ice in Game 2. Marc Messier decided to carry the club on his shoulders in Game 2 and open the scoring with a great solo rush. The game would remain close, but holding a 2-1 advantage with 1.22 remaining, Messier scored a carbon copy of the game's first goal to ensure victory. The series now shifted to Detroit. Where the Oilers managed some more late game heroics in game three. This time, with the score tied at one with just 36 seconds remaining in regulation, Marty McSorley put a loose puck behind Greg Steffen to give Edmonton a 2 1 win. McSorley carried his magic touch into game four when he assisted on Mike Krushelniski's second goal of the playoffs. The Oilers registered a 3 2 win and captured a three game to one series lead. Just like he did in game two, Mark Messier led the way in game five. Another pair of goals, including the game winner by the Moose, helped the Oilers to a five-game series victory. Edmonton would now prepare for the Wales Conference powerhouse, the Philadelphia Flyer. Still to come on the show, the Oilers are poised to win their third Stanley Cup in four years. But they faced a powerful Flyer squad in a rematch of the 1985 Finals. Highlights to return. With two of the highest scoring teams in the league facing off in the Stanley Cup final, many expected a shootout. While the scoring wasn't plentiful, it was impressive as the Oilers scored in bunches to claim a game one victory by a score of 4-2. With a couple of days off between games, both clubs were well rested heading into game two. Trailing by a goal early in the game, the Flyers responded. Derek Smith banged home a Scott Mellenby rebound to tie the game at one. Brian Propp would capitalize on some sloppy Edmonton play, scoring his 10th goal of the playoffs to give Philly a 2-1 lead. The Flyers could not contain the most powerful offense in the league, however, and Glenn Anderson would tie the game at two with a sensational individual effort. Overtime was required to decide a winner. Edmonton claimed a 3-2 victory when Yari Curry finished off a spectacular tic-tac-toe play to give Edmonton a two-game-to-none series advantage. 
The scene now shifted to the rowdy Philadelphia Spectrum. Mark Messier continued his incredible playoff run and scored a shorthanded goal to give Edmonton a 1 0 lead. The Flyers found themselves down 2 0 when Paul Coffey scored with just nine seconds remaining in the first period. Edmonton continued to pour it on in the second when Glenn Anderson provided another highlight reel goal. Now trailing by three, the Flyers tried to mount their comeback. Murray Craven redirected a Rick Tockett shot to get Philly on the board. Later, with the score of 3 2 Edmonton, Scott Mellenby beat Fuhrer from the top of the circle to tie the game at three. Incredibly, 17 seconds later, the Flyers would complete their miraculous comeback when Brad McCrimmon jumped into the play and scored the game-winning goal. With the Flyers on the verge of tying the series in game four, Wayne Gretzky single-handedly helped the Oilers regain the series' momentum. Leading 1-0, Gretzky showed remarkable patience, drawing both defenders to him and feathering a pass to Kevin Lowell for a shorthanded goal. After another Gretzky assist, the Oilers had firm control and would go on to a 4-1 victory. The game would not finish quietly, however. Frustrated by his team's performance, Ron Hextall let his emotions get the better of him and landed a wicked two-handed slash on Kent Nilsson. Cooler heads would eventually prevail and the focus would turn to Game 5 in Edmonton. It was speculated that when Hextall lost his cool, he would not be able to find his form in Game 5. Well, he proved the cynics wrong. Unfortunately for Hextall, he wasn't getting much help early in the game, and the Flyers found themselves trailing 3-1. Amazingly, Philadelphia would stage yet another astounding comeback. An unlikely source would get the rally started when Doug Crossman cut the lead to 3-2. Following the goal, the Oilers fell apart. Unable to clear the zone, Pelly Eklund was allowed to take a couple of whacks on the doorstep, eventually tying the game. The Flyers would take advantage of some more sloppy play when Rick Tockett scored his second goal of the game. Tockett's goal would hold up as the game winner as the Flyers rallied from two goals down to win it 4-3. I think we're more disappointed in game two, how we blew, a or game three, how we blew a 3-0 lead than, than tonight. I think that they were, I don't know if it was a matter of uh, us blowing the lead more tonight than they really came on and played a, a good second and third period tonight. Game six would start out much like game five. Goals by Kevin Lowe and Kevin McClellan had given the Oilers an early 2-0 lead. Remarkably, Philadelphia was able to reach down and begin yet another rally. Flyers and forward Dave Brown turned into a playmaker, centering to Lindsey Carson to get Philadelphia on the board. Brian Propp continued his impressive series against the Oilers and tied the game at two. J.J. Daniel would play the unlikely hero when his long shot found the back of the net, giving Philadelphia a 3-2 win and forcing a seventh and deciding game. The Flyers were on the verge of making history as they climbed back from a 3-1 series deficit to force a seventh game. Oiler fans were holding their collective breaths early in the contest as Murray Craven gave the Flyers a 1-0 lead for the first time in the series. Edmonton came flying back, however, as Anderson, Nilsson, and Messier combined on a beautiful goal to tie the game at one. The Oilers would regain the lead when Gretzky and Curry combined yet again to give Edmonton a 2-1 advantage. With momentum back on their side, Anderson would end the Flyers' dream of yet another comeback, slapping a 3-1 goal past Hextall. That was all the Oilers would need, and Edmonton celebrated their third Stanley Cup championship in the past four years. Plenty more to come on this edition of Frozen in Time. We'll find out if the Oilers would suffer from a Stanley Cup championship hangover as we revisit the 1988 regular season. Stay tuned. After winning their third Stanley Cup in four seasons, the Oilers were on top of the hockey world. Heading into the 1987-88 regular season, there were some key distractions around the Oilers' camp as Paul Coffey and Mark Messier were both holding out and negotiating new contracts. It would be a happy ending for Messier and the Oilers as both sides agreed to a new long-term contract, keeping the beloved Moose in Edmonton. Probably going to be here now. That's going to make me an Oiler for uh, start to finish in my career, I guess. And uh, that's more or less what I wanted uh, from the contract talks that started, as Glenn mentioned, uh, a little over a year ago. We had uh, mentioned from uh, the start of the contract talks that I wanted to stay here in Edmonton from, uh, and finish my career here, so 
That was one thing that uh, one of the things that we had uh, in mind the whole time we were talking, and uh, I'm certainly happy happy about that. The Ari Curry's now under a three-year contract. Glenn Anderson's got five years to go in his contract. Grant Fuhr has four years to go in his contract. So there's a lot of players here that are under long-term contracts, and to me that stabilizes this hockey club for future years. I found out a lot about the Edmonton Oilers organization, about how they felt towards me. I think that there's other players in the past that just a while ago that have renegotiated their contracts and that was all right. And all of a sudden I wanted to renegotiate mine and it wasn't all right. I feel that in those circumstances there were different two sets of rules on the hockey club and I don't think that was very fair. I don't think the Oilers are going to pay the kind of money that I want and you know as it started there's reports that I wanted $800,000 a year. And <coughs> I mean we've come down a lot from that and I think the price we're asking right now is more than fair enough and the Oilers obviously don't think I'm worth that kind of money so it might be better off to go somewhere else. As hard as it is for the organization to lose a player of Paul's stature, you sooner or later have to make the decision if it's painful it, that's the way it has to be. You've got other players that, have, that are working and you have to try and do what's best for them. They're working their rear ends off. There's probably no one closer to coffee on the Oilers than Wayne Gretzky. Gretzky says he knew something would happen sooner or later. It's a little too early to panic in this organization, but when you got the best team in the world and you can't fill the rink, you got to worry about the future. And uh, I'm sure that entered in the Oilers' minds uh, to make sure they get some young talent, to make sure they stay at the top. Good young players is what Glenn Sather wanted for Paul Coffey. And he certainly got a couple, Chris Joseph and Craig Simpson. I think Craig Simpson was really the key in the deal. And, uh, you know, they're, they all have an important part, but... You know, I don't know how you can rate each player, but Craig Simpson is certainly, he's 20 years old, he's uh, six foot two, he's 200 pounds, he's a player that has the ability to play any position up front, and that's what we're looking for. We're looking for somebody that can uh, step in and play a good role for us, and he's certainly going to be there for a long time. The addition of Craig Simpson paid immediate dividends. The Oilers' new left winger went on a scoring tear with his new club, potting 43 goals in just 59 games with Edmonton. Simpson helped the Oilers finish the year with a very respectable 99 points. But for the first time in seven seasons, they didn't win the division, finishing behind the Calgary Flames. The biggest surprise of the season was that Wayne Gretzky was not leading the league in scoring for the first time in eight years. Gretzky finished with 149 points, but trailed the new leader by 19. The new scoring champion was Mario Lemieux, who tallied a sensational 70 goals and 168 points. The Smythe Division Final was highly anticipated. It was two years prior in 1986 that the Flames had knocked out the heavily favored Oilers in seven games. Edmonton looked to exact some revenge, and they did just that in Game 1. Yari Curry and Wayne Gretzky both scored as the Oilers registered a 3-1 victory. The Flames responded in Game 2, however. A pair of long slap shots by Lanny McDonald and Al McInnes helped give Calgary an early 2-0 lead. Later in the second period, with the Flames up 3-1, Charlie Huddy would cut the lead in half when his point shot found its way through traffic. After the teams exchanged goals in the third period, Calgary held a 4-3 advantage. The Oilers would tie things up thanks to a great individual effort by Yari Curry that sent the game to overtime. It took nearly eight minutes of extra time to decide the winner. And Wayne Gretzky played the hero when he had a partial break down the wing and beat Mike Vernon with a perfect slap shot. The Oilers had swept games in Calgary and carried a 2-0 series lead home to Edmonton. Hock and Lube scored a shorthanded goal to help the Flames out to an early 1-0 lead in Game 3. That lead, however, would not last long, as Charlie Huddy quickly tied things up. The Oilers would not relinquish the lead again, as Glenn Anderson and Yari Curry helped power Edmonton to a 4-2 win. Edmonton now held a 3-0 series advantage, and were on the verge of eliminating Calgary. The Oilers jumped out in Game 4 with an impressive effort and quickly piled up a 3-0 lead. Calgary would attempt the comeback, but it was too little and too late. The Oilers posted a 6-4 victory and in the process gained redemption for their 1986 seven-game loss to the Flames with a dominating four-game sweep of their arch rivals. The short four-game series with Calgary had helped Edmonton immensely. It provided the entire club with a few extra days rest to heal and prepare for the conference final against the Detroit Red Wings. There's good things and bad things about a layoff that long. First of all, the good things are it gives the injuries and all the bumps and bruises a chance to heal a little bit so that 
by the time I think both teams go into the next series, we'll all be you know in good shape and and uh, ready to go. Uh, that length of time, though, means that we have to be even more disciplined during practice time. The coaches uh, work on us regularly, and, and the intensity level comes down from such a high of winning the series before that it's hard to keep uh, that intensity towards practice, and it's something we have to work on. The year before, in 1987, Edmonton had underestimated the Red Wings in Game 1 and were shocked with a 2-1 loss. The Oilers were determined to avoid a repeat of that series opener. With Wayne Gretzky leading the way, Edmonton's special teams were unstoppable. Yari Curry, Randy Gregg, and Craig Simpson were all benefactors of Gretzky's three power play assists, and Edmonton grabbed an early series lead with a 4-1 victory in Game 1. Game 2 would be a much tougher affair, however, as Detroit claimed an early 1-0 lead just 2:03 into the first period. The Wings continued to apply the pressure, and a Mel Bridgman goal gave the Red Wings a 3-1 lead. With the Oilers' offensive potential, however, they were really never out of a game. Mark Messier cut the lead in half when he left the penalty box, picked up the loose puck, and had a breakaway from center ice. The Oilers then tied the game at three, thanks to some great passing between Gretzky, Tikkanen, and Curry. The quick turnaround by the Oilers had sent the Red Wings reeling. Edmonton would capitalize on their sloppy play, and the combination of Craig Simpson and Mark Messier would seal a 5-3 victory. Detroit would play an inspired game three in front of their home crowd, and Brent Ashton led the charge with a pair of goals. The Red Wings would register a 5-2 win and now trail the Oilers two games to one. Game four would prove to be another tough test for Edmonton. With the score tied at one, Wayne Gretzky decided to take over and supplied a pair of perfect passes to Glenn Anderson and Yari Curry that gave Edmonton a 3-1 lead. The Red Wings would not back down, however, and they clawed their way back into the game. With the score 3-2, Bob Probert tallied a power play goal to send the game to overtime. In the extra frame, Lee Norwood's outlet pass would be picked off by Tikkanen. And after a nice pass to Curry, the puck was behind Glenn Hanlon, giving the Oilers a 4-3 overtime victory. Detroit now had nothing left after such a crushing loss, and Game 5 proved to be a cakewalk for the Oilers. Edmonton scored eight times with Crown Campbell Conference champs after beating the Red Wings four games to one. Edmonton would now prepare to face the Boston Bruins in the Stanley Cup Final. Both goaltenders were quite sharp for their respective clubs early in Game 1, but it was the Oilers who got on the board first. Steve Smith's point shot was stopped, but Wayne Gretzky was there for the rebound to bang it home past Andy Moog to take the 1-0 lead. The Bruins would tie the score at 1 when Cam Neely blasted a slap shot from the top of the circle past Grant Fuhrer. Edmonton would continue to pressure Moog, and while the Bruins' netminder stood tall, he couldn't hold them off forever. Keith Acton finally deflected the game-winning goal past Moog as the Oilers took Game 1 by a score of 2-1. Boston got into some early trouble in Game 2 thanks to an undisciplined high-sticking penalty by goaltender Reggie Lemelin. On the ensuing power play, Wayne Gretzky set up Glenn Anderson's deflection beautifully, and Edmonton grabbed an early 1-0 lead. Some more penalty trouble by the Bruins gave the Oilers a two-man advantage. Edmonton gained a 2-0 advantage when Messier tipped home Gretzky's point shot. Boston showed a lot of moxie, however, and battled back. Fuhrer gave up a weak goal to Bob Joyce that cut the lead in half, and former Oiler Ken Linsman tied the game at two when he scored on his own rebound. The Bruins' comeback effort would be all for naught, however, as a rookie mistake cost them the game. First-year defenseman Glenn Wesley gave the puck away, and Gretzky was set in alone to seal a 4-2 Oilers victory. The series would shift to the Boston Garden. It wouldn't give the Bruins any momentum in Game 3. After grabbing an early 1-0 lead on a Randy Burge goal, the Bruins fell apart. Wayne Gretzky registered a goal and two assists as Edmonton registered four unanswered goals. The Oilers would cruise to a 6-0 win and grab the firm three-game-to-none series lead. Game 4 would go down in the history books as one of the most memorable. Game 4 looked different in more ways than one. Boston led for only the second time in the series until Craig Simpson beat Andy Moog late in the second period to tie the score. But before the lights could go out on the Bruins, they literally went out on everyone. A power failure at Boston Garden that emptied the seats, sending the players to the dressing rooms waiting and wondering when their quest for the cup would finally resume and forcing fans to leave the arena after witnessing perhaps Boston's best performance in the final, while the media flocked to John Ziegler to find out exactly what was going on. Approximately 9.33 p.m., we're informed there was an overload of a 4,000-volt switch 
on a transformer unit outside of the building. This was on a piece of railroad equipment that the garden here inherited about a year ago. This tripped a switch, shutting down the main power. As a result of that, we were not confident, the building wasn't confident that it could resume its power without a failure later on tonight. So that tonight's game had to be called off. The next night, game four was started again. And with the Oilers trailing in the first period, Norm Lacombe quickly tied the game at one. Ken Lindsman continued to be a thorn in his former team's side and scored a power play goal to regain Boston's one goal lead. The Oilers seemed to be a team of destiny, however, and they continued to get the lucky bounces. Down by a score of 2-1 and on the power play, Essa Tikkanen tried a centering pass that deflected off Gord Kluzek's skate and into the Boston Bruins' net to tie the game at two. The offense continued to flow. Mike Krushelinski would bang home a 3-2 goal on a feed from Kevin McClellan. With the Stanley Cup on their sights, Gretzky scored another power play goal to seal the victory. The Oilers have completed the four-game sweep of the Bruins and successfully captured their second consecutive Stanley Cup and fourth in five seasons. Ahead on the show, the Oilers send shockwaves through the sporting world when they make a blockbuster deal with the Los Angeles Kings. Will the deal turn out to be a great one? Find out after the break. Fresh off their second consecutive Stanley Cup and fourth title in five years, the Edmonton Oilers made one of the most significant trades in the history of sport. If my fellow Edmontonians are upset about this, I understand. But I ask you to view this trade the same way Wayne asked me to view his request to be traded. I'm disappointed about having to leave Edmonton. I truly admire all the fans and respect everyone over the years. But um, I don't want to try and philosophize on what's happened because I don't think we can uh, justify the reasons why this has happened. But we're all trying to do something that's good for for Wayne, for the Edmonton Oilers, for the National Hockey League. It was a bold and shocking move by the Oilers when they traded the best player in the league. One of the key components of the deal was center Jimmy Carson, who had the unfortunate task of trying to replace the great one as Yari Curry's line mate. But, uh, he seems to have a strong get, good with the puck, and he can shoot the puck, and uh, he's going to be a good center. We believe that. Edmonton responded to the blockbuster trade quite well in the early going. The Oilers still had a swagger about them, thanks in large part to a powerful offense. Edmonton's scoring prowess was still considered among the league's elite, and it was led by perennial all-stars such as Curry, Messier, and Anderson. Throw in a supporting cast of Jimmy Carson, Craig Simpson, and Essa Tikkanen, and it's no surprise that the Oilers posted a 15-8-3 mark through the first two months of the regular season. Not surprisingly, the negative impact of trading the greatest player in the league did materialize as the season progressed. Once able to lean and rely on Gretzky through their typical mid-season lulls, the Oilers were now vulnerable to slumps and losing streaks. After an impressive first two months in which Edmonton posted a record seven games above 500, Edmonton's season went south. Over the final four months of the year, the Oilers recorded a losing record of 23-26-5 to finish in third place in the Smythe Division with 84 points. It was their lowest total in almost a decade. As fate would have it, Edmonton's first round opponent would be none other than Wayne Gretzky and the LA Kings. Game one proved to be a highly entertaining series opener. The Kings got on the board first when Chris Contos deflected a Bernie Nichols point shot past Grant Fuhrer. Los Angeles would not hold the lead for very long, though, as Thomas Janssen scored a power play goal to tie things up at one. The game was a back-and-forth affair with both teams exchanging goals. The Kings carried a 3-2 lead late into the game, but with less than four minutes remaining, Essa Tikkanen tied things up at three. Just over a minute later, Messier, Anderson, and Simpson executed a beautiful three-on-two rush to complete the comeback 
and capture game one by a score of 4-3. Game two started much the same way as game one. Chris Conto scored the opening goal for the second straight time and gave the Kings an early 1-0 lead. Mark Messier, however, scored a vintage Messier goal to tie the game, coming down his off wing and snapping it past Kelly Rudy. Los Angeles would regain control of the game, and Contos would beat Fuhr top shelf for his second goal and a 3-1 Kings lead. Wayne Gretzky would exact some revenge on his former team, beating Fuhr on the odd man rush to give the Kings a 4-1 lead. Chris Contos then finished the greatest game of his young NHL career by registering the hat trick. Los Angeles boasting a 5-2 victory, and they tied the series at a game apiece. Edmonton would rebound nicely when they returned home for Game 3. Grant Fuhrer played a spectacular contest and made 26 saves for his fourth career playoff shutout, helping the Oilers claim a two-game-to-one series lead. Essa Tikkanen and Yari Curry supplied the majority of the offense for the Oilers, Tikkanen registering a pair of assists and Curry scoring a pair of goals as Edmonton posted a solid 4-0 victory. The next night in Game 4, both teams came out flying. With the score already tied at 1, Jimmy Carson showed great speed through the neutral zone and great determination in getting his own rebound to give Edmonton the 2-1 lead. Los Angeles would come storming back, though. Chris Contos tying the game when he banged in a Bernie Nichols rebound. The Kings then took the lead, thanks to an unexpected scoring source. L.A. defenseman Tom Laidlaw had scored just three times during the regular season, but his power play goal in Game 4 could not have come at a better time, as it gave the Kings a 3-2 lead. Edmonton would quickly rebound, however, when Norm Lacombe would score on a long, weak goal and Kelly Rudy to even the score at three. The score remained that way until late in the third, when with 30 seconds remaining in regulation, Steve Smith jumped into the play and pounded in a rebound. Smith's goal giving the Oilers a 4-3 win and a 3-1 stranglehold on the series. Game five would be another close contest. The Kings opened the scoring with a man advantage. Wayne Gretzky centered to Chris Contos, who scored the opening goal for the third time in the series. Gretzky would register his second assist when he set up Bernie Nichols, and the Kings took the 2-0 lead. With a score 2-1, it was Robitaille's turn to light the lamp, and he beat Fuhrer on a backhand to regain the Kings' two-goal advantage. The trio of Robitaille, Nichols, and Gretzky would dominate as Los Angeles took Game 5 by a score of 4-2. The Kings were still alive, but they trailed the series three games of two. Edmonton had let an opportunity to bury the Kings slip away in Game 5. They tried to remedy that by scoring first in Game 6. Los Angeles would not give in, though. Facing a do-or-die situation for the second straight game, their effort was remarkable. Grant Fuhrer didn't help the Oilers cause any, as he gave up a weak goal to Jim Weimer from a terrible angle. Wayne Gretzky would then set up Chris Contos for another goal, as the Kings won 4-1 and did the unthinkable. They forced a Game 7 after trailing the series three games to one. The Kings hit the ice for Game 7 in front of a frenzied home crowd. L.A. fans would have reason to cheer early in the first period. Breaking out on a two-on-one, Wayne Gretzky would keep and convert to open the scoring. Edmonton would respond on another odd man rush. Yari Curry's initial shot was stopped, but his second found the back of the net to tie the game at one. The Kings' power play would take over late in the game. With a score tied at three, Gretzky would find Bernie Nichols all alone behind the defense to give Los Angeles a 4-3 advantage. Controversy would then surround the next goal of the game. With the Kings on another power play, Dale DeGray's point shot would find the back of the net. Grant Fuhrer would protest vehemently that he'd been interfered with, and a replay of the goal would prove he had reason to complain. The goal would stand, and the Kings had a 5-3 lead. In a storybook ending, Wayne Gretzky would score an empty net goal to clinch a 6-3 win and eliminate his former club in a highly entertaining seven-game series. When we return on the show, the Oilers had responded with a Stanley Cup victory after their embarrassing playoff loss to the Flames in 1986. Could they do the same after being shown the door by Gretzky and the Kings in 1989? Stick around. Edmonton was no longer the dominant club they had been through the mid-80s. This was evident by the 4-5-3 and three record that the Oilers posted in the first month of play in 89-90. It was not acceptable for general manager Glenn Sather, and he quickly shook things up with a blockbuster trade. On November 2nd of 1989, Sather dealt Jimmy Carson, Kevin McClellan, and a fifth-round draft pick to the Detroit Red Wings. In return, the Oilers received Peter Klima, Joe Murphy, 
Adam Graves, and Jeff Sharples. The shakeup of that magnitude to a locker room takes some time to getting adjusted to. And Edmonton won just two of their next eight games. The Oilers had struggled as they hit the quarter season mark, but Sather's big move paid off in droves. Edmonton posting a remarkable 32-19-9 record the rest of the year to help them finish with 90 points, good for second in the Smite division. Edmonton's opening round opponents would be the Winnipeg Jets. The Oilers had enjoyed plenty of postseason success against their division rivals, and early in Game 1, it looked like that trend would continue. Winnipeg, however, showed plenty of determination and firepower in the series opener. The Jets played a wide-open run-and-gun game that saw them display significant firepower. Edmonton's Bill Ranford was beaten an incredible seven times. And the Oilers dropped Game 1 by a score of 7-5. to five. Well, yeah, he struggled. There's no question about that. And I think he'd be the first one to admit it. He, he has to fight back now. Uh, he'll probably be in the Nets uh, come to uh, Friday, I guess, as we play. Uh, Billy's performed well all year long. Uh, he's a battler, he's a competitor, and uh, he has to dig down deep and come back now. Game two started where game one had finished off, with Winnipeg scoring at will. Brent Ashton and Paul McDermott both registered first period goals to give the Jets a 2-0 lead. Finding themselves down a pair early in the game woke up the slumbering Oiler offense. Craig Simpson cut into Winnipeg's lead when he slid a rebound past Stefan Beauregard. The Oilers started to gain some momentum and continued to press. Mark Lamb's tenacious forecheck led to Joe Murphy's tying goal that sent the game to overtime. In the extra frame, the Oilers received an unexpected hero. Yari Curry fed the puck to Mark Lamb, who split the defense and beat Beauregard on the backhand for a 3-2 victory. In Game 4, Edmonton continued to discover that the Jets were no pushovers. Winnipeg was getting scoring from all four lines and held on to a precarious 3-2 lead in the third period. The Jets were given a scare late in the game when Glenn Anderson drove hard to the net and crashed into Bob Essenza. Essenza was shaken up and had to leave the game. The Oilers would immediately take advantage of the goaltending change. Essatikin and blasted a slap shot past Stefan Beauregard to tie the game at four and send it to overtime. After 20 minutes of extra play, the score remained tied. In double overtime, Thomas Steen was sent in on the breakaway, but was hauled down. On the ensuing power play, the Jets finished the marathon off when Dave Ellett's point shot found the back of the net to give Winnipeg a 4-3 victory and a three-game-to-one stranglehold on the series. If they beat us in the series, we have to say we got beaten by a better team, but as, as long as we go out and do the things that we're capable of doing, we feel very confident our dressing room will be successful. The Jets tried to pounce on the Oilers early in Game 5. Winnipeg grabbed a 1-0 lead thanks to a great individual effort by Thomas Steen on the power play. In the second period, Winnipeg's power play continued to click, and Brent Ashton scored with a man advantage to give Winnipeg the 2-0 lead. Edmonton, now desperate to stay alive in the game and in the series, came roaring back. First, it was Craig Simpson banging in a rebound to cut the lead in half. Next, Essa Tekinen redirected a point shot past Beauregard to tie the game at 2. And finally, Glenn Anderson and Messi combined on a pretty goal to give the Oilers the lead. Edmonton's veterans had stepped up when they were needed the most and registered a 3-2 victory. Mark Messier had scored the winner in Game 5 and opened the scoring in Game 6 when he converted a 2-on-1 with a backhand past Bob Essenza. The Oilers gave themselves a two-goal cushion when Yari Curry set up a Randy Gregg redirection. The Jets would not back down, however, and scored a pair to tie it up highlighted by Dale Howarchuk's steal and set up for Doug Smale. After each team scored another goal, the score was tied up at three apiece. Until Edmonton broke out on a two-on-one. Mark Lamb would drop it for Curry, who rifled a slap shot past Beauregard for their second consecutive 4-3 win, forcing a seventh and deciding game. Unfortunately for the Jets, the Oilers' playoff experience proved to be too much. Glenn Anderson opened the scoring when he broke down the wing taking Teppo Newman and wide and beating Beauregard to give Edmonton a 1-0 lead. Mark Lamb, the Oilers' newfound scoring source, continued his playoff success and scored the 2-1 goal on a breakaway. Essa Tikkanen and Yari Curry would register a goal in Edmonton's 4-1 Game 7 victory. The Oilers barely escaped the first-round upset. Still to come on the show, Edmonton was looking for redemption in the 1990 Division Final as they had a rematch with the LA Kings. Would they be successful? Find out next.
Next up for Edmonton were the division final. The Oilers finally had a chance at redemption for their heartbreaking seven-game loss to Wayne Gretzky and the Kings the year before. Game one did not turn out to be the highly emotional contest that everyone had anticipated. Instead, it was an old-fashioned drubbing. Edmonton receiving contributions from all four forward lines. As Oilers, both young and old, joined in on the scoring. The Kings had no answer for the offensive onslaught as Edmonton racked up an easy 7-0 victory to open the series. Los Angeles did not fare much better in Game 2. The Oilers were obviously motivated by the 1989 playoff failure and continued to pour on the offense. Mark Messier played set-up man on the Oilers' power play, registering a pair of assists with the man advantage as Edmonton embarrassed the Kings for the second straight game with a 6-1 win. L.A. was a much different club playing in front of their hometown fans for Game 3. The Kings finally received some offense from their veterans. And Thomas Sandstrom opened the scoring. Los Angeles played with a lot more determination and kept the game close. The Oilers, with so much playoff experience, always seemed to find a way to win the close contest. Game 3 was no different. Coming out of the penalty box late in the game, Adam Graves had a clear breakaway on Goslin to help the Oilers win 5-4 and gain a three-game-to-none series advantage. Game 4 opened much like the first two games had with the Oilers getting out to a quick two-goal lead. The Kings would not give up and continued to chip away at the lead and remain in the game. Edmonton just couldn't seem to put the game away, and the score was tied at 5-5 at the end of regulation. Joe Murphy would play the hero for the Oilers in overtime when he buried a rebound to win 6-5 and eliminate the L.A. Kings in four straight. Game one began with the Oilers showing no rust whatsoever. Despite not having played in nearly 10 days, Edmonton looked to be firing on all cylinders. They found themselves enjoying a comfortable 3-0 lead. Mike Keenan's Blackhawks did not finish first in the Norris Division by giving up, though, just because they were down by a few goals. Wayne Presley and Steve Larmer both scored to cut the Oiler lead and trailed 3-2. That would be as close as the Hawks would get, however, as Craig McTavish made a great move at the blue line around Dave Manson, broke in, and beat Ed Belfort. The Oilers would take the first game of the series with a 5-2 victory. Mike Keenan decided to start Greg Millen in net for Game 2. The move seemed to spark the Blackhawks' offense as Troy Murray and Denny Savard both scored to give Chicago a 2-0 lead. It was nearly impossible to keep Edmonton off the score sheet for an entire game, however, and Mark Messier cut the lead in half by setting up Glenn Anderson. Shortly after, Yari Curry registered a power play goal and it was a brand new hockey game with a score tied at two. With the score tied at three and only two minutes remaining in regulation, Doug Wilson pounced on a rebound and put it past Brantford to give the Blackhawks a 4-3 win. Chicago carried that momentum into game three. They received scoring from some role players as well as their star players and tallied an impressive five unanswered goals en route to a 5-1 victory. Chicago now held two-game to one series lead. Keeney's decision to go with Greg Millen in the past two games had paid off handsomely. The Chicago head coach would not be pleased with Millen's performance in game four, however. Having already allowed two early goals, Millen couldn't control a rebound, and Craig Simpson took advantage, banging in the 3-1 goal. Keenan was not impressed and replaced Millen with Jacques Cloutier. The new Chicago netminder did not fare much better. Mark Messier was in all alone to seal a 4-2 Edmonton victory. The game of musical goaltenders continued with Jacques Cloutier getting the start for Chicago in Game 5. Cloutier did not fare much better early on as Randy Gregg and Craig Simpson both scored to give the Oilers a 2-0 lead. The Blackhawks were able to work their way back into the game, but it turned out to be a nasty affair. There was plenty of stick work and physical play highlighted by a brutal elbow on Denny Savard by Marc Messier. The Oiler captain had been relatively quiet for much of the series, but he stepped up his effort in Game 5. Messier provided plenty of physical play and registered two goals and two assists as Edmonton won 4-3. The Oilers now led the series three games to two. Game 6 started nicely for Edmonton when Essa Tikkanen scored on a shorthanded breakaway for an early 1-0 lead. The Oilers had a chance to put the Blackhawks away, and thanks to a little pretty passing, they weren't going to waste it. They dominated the game physically and defensively as the Oilers capitalized on Chicago's mistakes. Edmonton would not be denied another trip to the Stanley Cup final and handily dismissed to the Blackhawks 
with an 8-4 victory. The Oilers would now prepare to face the Bruins in the Stanley Cup Final for the second time in three seasons. Game one started with the Bruins coming out strong. Edmonton netminder Bill Ranford stood up to the pressure and made some big saves early in the first period. The Oilers seemed to feed off their goaltender's efforts and quickly gained a 2-0 lead. Boston defenseman Ray Bork would get the Bruins on the board, scoring his first of the game from the slot. Cam Neely would then feed a beautiful cross-ice pass to Bork for his second of the game, a goal that evened the score at two. The score would remain that way through 60 minutes of play. The game would require triple overtime to decide a victor, and it would be the Oilers who would come out on top. Infrequently used forward Peter Klima was given a rare shift, or to give his teammates rest than anything else, and managed to beat Moog 5-hole to give the Oilers a 3-2 win in a grueling series opener. Game 2 started out slowly, and Edmonton held a 1-0 lead late in the period, courtesy of a Yari Curry deflection. With less than a minute remaining in the opening frame, Ray Bork beat Bill Ranford to make the score 1-1 after 20 minutes of play. But unfortunately for the Bruins, it was all downhill from there. Edmonton came storming back and quickly took control of the game. Curry had a sensational night and recorded his seventh career hat-trick as the Oilers took the game by a score of 7-2 and now led the series two games to nothing. The series shifted to Edmonton for game three and the Oilers quickly dug a hole for themselves. Just 10 seconds into the game, the Bruins capitalized on a Kevin Lowe turnover when Adam Oates banged in Cam Neely's rebound to give Boston a 1-0 lead. The Bruins weren't done there. Randy Burridge added to the lead when he laced a snapshot past Bill Ranford. From there, it was the Andy Moog show. The Boston netminder was sensational and stopped 28 of 29 shots as the Bruins registered a 2-1 victory to get them back into the series. Early in Game 4, it was the Bruins' turn to make a mental mistake when Bobby Carpenter took an undisciplined goaltender interference penalty. The lethal Edmonton power play promptly made them pay when Glenn Anderson scored a beautiful goal on Andy Moog to give the Oilers a 1-0 lead. Bruins standout defenseman Ray Bork stood out for the wrong reason later in the game. He turned the puck over to Mark Messier, who had set up Anderson for his second goal of the game to give the Oilers a two-goal lead. Edmonton would go on to record a convincing 5-1 victory. They were on the verge of winning their fifth Stanley Cup now that they held a 3-1 series advantage. With a chance to put the series away, the Oilers came out with passion and purpose in Game 5. Glenn Anderson continued his inspired play and scored a highlight real goal to give Edmonton a 1-0 lead. Anderson proved that he was just as adept as a passer as a goal scorer when he set up Craig Simpson for another beautiful goal. Bill Ranford was solid between the pipes and made 29 saves to cap off a spectacular postseason performance. The Oilers would not be refused their place among the great franchises in NHL history as they recorded their fifth Stanley Cup title in seven seasons. With all the controversy, criticism, and pessimism surrounding the 1990 Edmonton Oilers, this may have been their sweetest victory of all. They had successfully overcome the trade of Wayne Gretzky and acclimatized themselves to new teammates. One of the more remarkable aspects of their years of domination was their ability to keep a core group of players together. Edmonton had seven players that were members of all five Stanley Cup championship teams. Pretty impressive total. The Oilers would be remembered for the talent, finesse, speed, and creativity with which they played. Edmonton had been one of the most exciting and inspiring teams to watch during their run of greatness, and their dynasty will forever be frozen in time. Thanks for watching. I'm Dan Pollard. We'll see you again next time.